Good morning. <laughs> so it's last day today. Yeah. So uh, now we are going to uh, summarize a little bit uh, about all the things we have been looking at. Uh, and uh, <coughs> a good way of summarizing the uh, 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, which constitute the Buddhist path, uh, is by looking at the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, because the Noble Eightfold Path really is the uh, crux of everything. Uh, so this is like the last set of eights uh, on this of this 37 and as we do this we're also going to include I hope the four right efforts uh, and a little bit about the four mindfulness meditations as well the four satipatthanas to bring all of those things together that's the plan we'll see what happens uh. <laughs> so um, first uh, sutta we're going to have a look at is uh, uh, called ignorance there's a page 120 uh, in your little booklet uh, and this uh, shows just uh, gives a brief some brief information about the meaning of the noble eightfold path uh, and uh, we'll start with that and then we will define things in more detail as we as we go along here so ignorance this pali word uh, avidja uh, which uh, can sometimes perhaps better be translated as delusion or uh, or something like that uh, and um <laughs> Paparazzi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> and so this is how this uh, sutra goes. So, so I have heard. Uh, at one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindaka's monastery. There, the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, uh, venerable sir, they replied, and the Buddha said this. Uh, Mendicants, ignorance precedes the attainment of unskillful qualities uh, with lack of conscience and prudence following along. Uh, an ignoramus, <laughs> sunken ignorance, uh, gives rise to wrong view. So let's just stop there. That is uh, uh, the very beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path you have right there, wrong view. So you give rise to wrong view. Uh, and uh, actually, let me, let me read out the full paragraph. Wrong view gives rise to wrong thought. Uh, wrong thought gives rise to wrong speech. Uh, wrong speech gives rise to wrong action. Uh, wrong action gives rise to wrong livelihood. Wrong livelihood gives rise to wrong effort. Uh, wrong effort gives rise to wrong mindfulness. Wrong mindfulness gives rise to wrong samadhi or immersion. Uh, so one of the uh, important points here that uh, uh, is not always appreciated perhaps is that the Noble Eightfold Path is a, again a one of these causal sequences. Uh, a lot of things on the Buddhist path are causal uh, where one follows the other one because of the conditioning fact, conditioning effect of one on the next one. Uh, and this is just as true as it is of the Noble Eightfold Path, as it is of the seven awakening factors, uh, as it is of the uh, five spiritual faculties and the five powers. Uh, all of these are causal sequences in the same way here. And as always, because it is a causal sequence, one of the things that I've been trying to point out, uh, it is true of dependent origination, it is true of all of these ones. Uh, because it is a causal sequence, the first one uh, is often the most important one. Uh, so you have to get the first one into place, and the more clearly, the more uh, clear the first one is, uh, the more committed and the more um, effort and the more ability you will have to pursue the rest of the path. So the idea of right view is actually really significant. Uh, and uh, again, of course, the way to get that right view, that confidence in the faith, is ultimately it is to read the suttas or to have some insight into what the Buddha taught. Uh, so this, for this reason, right view is um, is important, and uh, it is some often emphasized quite a bit in the suttas. I want to have quite a bit of look at right view, precisely because it starts everything out. Uh, so we'll come to that in a, in a second here. But here it says that even before you have wrong view or right view or whatever, uh, the thing that lies behind uh, right, wrong view here is uh, said to be ignorance or delusion. Uh, you are deluded about reality, and because you are deluded about reality, uh, you have wrong view. Uh, in other words, you're not seeing things as they actually are. You have a misunderstanding of how things work. And part of that, uh, what happens when you do that, uh, all unwholesome qualities comes from that delusion. Uh, well, the less deluded you are, uh, 
the more wholesome qualities you have. Uh, whenever, whenever you have something unwholesome arising in you, it is because of delusion, because of avijja. Yeah, so it is a distortion of reality, that's what's happening when you follow some kind of wrong action in body, speech or mind. Uh, and, uh, uh, the, and that delusion, of course, is just not understanding the consequence of our actions. That's really what it means. Uh, not understanding how it uh, causes trouble for yourself, both here and now. If you fully understood how the unskillful actions, body, speech and mind, cause trouble for you, uh, you would never do them. Because, you're, again, it's like touching hot coal. If you see a hot coal, you, you don't touch it because you know it's going to suffer. You know you're going to suffer as a consequence. Uh, in the same way, if you fully understand the nature of your actions, uh, you just wouldn't do them because you understand they're like hot coals. Uh, why get angry on someone else when you are the one who will suffer most from that anger or from those actions that come from that anger? This is just the lack of insight into the nature of uh, you know, basic nature of how actions always have a, a result and often the result comes straight away uh, as well. Uh, and this is where we can understand karma, as I mentioned before. The idea of karma really is the most powerful uh, when you understand how it affects you straight away. Now you can feel the connection between your action and how you feel about yourself. Uh. So avidja is the problem and then because of avidja then uh, it says here that uh, uh, conscience and prudence follow along when you have avidja or you are deluded uh, or a lack of prudence and conscience. Uh, and these are two Pali words called uh, hiriotapa and uh, they are not very prominent in the suttas but they occur in a few places. Uh, and hiriotapa are said to be the guardians of the world for example. Uh, because if there is no hiri, uh, here translated as conscience, uh, could also be translated as shame. Shame might be closer to the uh, kind of to the original meaning of this. Uh, these are the things that stop the world from kind of collapsing into barbarianism. Yeah, where everyone is just warring and hurting everyone else, and nobody really cares about anything. Yeah? These are the two things that uh, hold the world aloft, make it civilized, if you like. Uh, we can deal with each other in a in a good way, rather than just uh, being at war with each other and, and doing, being stupid in all possible ways. Uh. So these two words, hiri, hiri probably means something like shame. So a little bit of shame is not bad according to Buddhism. Uh. Sometimes people think that sh shame is like a bad quality, there's no need to be shameful about everything, but like so many other things, it depends how you are shame, ha what kind of shame you have. Sometimes shame can be bad, uh, because sometimes it is just blocks you and it's not really relating to anything useful. Uh, but at other times a little bit of shame is a positive thing uh, according to the uh, Buddhist teaching. So we have to know to distinguish between good shame and bad shame. Uh, this is one of those kind of significant things. And good shame is the kind of shame you feel inside of yourself. Sometimes there's a shame we feel when other people know what we have done. Yeah? Every, uh, you've done something bad and then you think, oh no, everybody knows about it and uh, you feel really bad about that. Uh, and that shame is uh, maybe not so useful and sometimes it can be actually de very detrimental. Uh, but the shame that you have when you do something bad and nobody knows about it, but you know it is bad and you feel bad about yourself. Uh, it's like you feel ashamed of having done something which isn't right personally. Uh, that is a kind of a positive shame because it means uh, you understand what is pure and what is impure and you feel bad about doing things that are impure uh, because you know it is wrong and it just doesn't feel right. Uh, and that is a, a positive thing because that guides you in the right way. If you haven't got that sort of shame, it becomes very hard to distinguish uh, between what is good and what is bad in the world. Uh. And this is very similar to the sense of conscience. Yeah? Conscience means that, again, you feel bad about yourself. It's a very personal experience if you do something which is inappropriate, like stealing or lying or something like that. Uh, classical examples of this. Uh. So, um, uh, so this, th that is what shame is about. Here, does it also mean socially sanctioned shame so that when other people look at you, you feel bad? Maybe it includes that a little bit as well, huh? but only to the extent that you do something that is really bad and really wrong. Huh? Sometimes we feel shameful even if we haven't done anything bad, and that's where it becomes kind of silly huh? and stupid and useless. Huh? And the other one of these two is uh, otapa, and otapa means having a, 
a fear of the consequences of what you're doing, uh, knowing that it will lead uh, to uh, negative things in the future. Uh, yeah, if you do something really bad, uh, you steal something, uh, you might go to prison. Uh, yeah, that's kind of one of the consequences of doing something bad. Uh, but also, it will lead in the future, it will lead to a, a decline, and eventually your mind state will become coarser, more dark, less bright, less energetic. And of course, eventually that will lead, may lead to a bad rebirth as well. Uh. So this is the otapa aspect, the fear of the consequences, here called prudence by Adan Sujato. You are prudent, you understand uh, the consequences of things. Uh. So these are the guardians of the world, and if you have complete, if you are really deluded, uh, you have no idea uh, about these things, uh, and uh, you have no sense of any of these, uh, and for that reason you end up doing uh, uh, lots of bad things as a consequence. Uh, and all of these unskillful qualities arise because of that. Uh. So, because you are ignorant and, and silly, and uh, you have a bad conditioning from the past, it's not really your fault, this is the conditioning arising from the past, uh, then that is equivalent to wrong view, uh, pretty much. Well, here it says it gives rise to wrong view, but these things are really closely related to each other. Uh, when you have wrong view, what happens is that you have wrong aims in life, wrong purposes. Uh, he has wrong thought here. Uh, I prefer something like wrong intention or wrong purpose or wrong aim. Uh, in other words, you are not heading towards anything that is useful. Uh, instead, you're heading towards suffering, really. Uh, you don't have an aim that leads you towards happiness or contentment and all of these kind of things. Uh, that's the problem with wrong view. Uh, if you want to suffer, you have wrong view. If you don't want to suffer, you've got to have right view. Uh, why is that? Because um, uh, when you think about it, it's very obvious, because if you don't understand how the world works, if you have a wrong idea about the world, uh, you cannot act on reality as it actually is. Uh, it's a bit like, uh, uh, you know, the obvious example, uh, an obvious example is if you want to, uh, that I always like to use, is simply if you want to invest on the stock market. Uh, if you have a wrong view about the stocks, uh, and you invest in all the companies that are doing really badly, uh, you're going to end up very poor afterwards. You've got wrong view, uh, you end up suffering, uh, yeah? <laughs> it's a very worldly comparison, but it gives you the idea of seeing world clearly, yeah? And this is then becomes problematic. But if you have right view, you know which companies are going to do well, then uh, you kind of can make more money on the stock market. Uh. <laughs> Not that I would uh, ne necessarily recommend a lot of uh, these sort of things, but it's, you know, it's okay to, everyone needs some investments. So. But that's not really the point, just to give a simile for how this works. So. So, and it's exactly the same thing in life. If you understand how life works, uh, you can live life in such a way that it gives rise to ha uh, happiness, contentment for yourself and for others. Uh, wrong view is always problematic. Uh, not seeing things according to reality is always a, a very detrimental thing, obviously. Uh, so you strive to see things in the right way. Uh, and um, that I includes knowing who has the right information. Yeah? It includes knowing that you should go to the Buddha, you should go to the noble ones. Uh, and of course that is uh, one of the first, that's why faith and the Kalyanamitta is so important at the beginning of the path. Uh, because if you have no idea where to get your information, if you think your information should be got from, you know, uh, from Hollywood movies or something like that, or from other kind of you know characters who are popular in popular culture, uh, and that is where you look up. Those people are the ones you look up to. Then uh, you're not really going to go very far on this path. So this so a wrong view gives uh, uh, rise to wrong aim. You're heading for the things that are useless in life, uh, and because you have the wrong aim, you start doing all the silly things. Yeah, then you have wrong speech as a consequence, you have wrong action, you have wrong livelihood. Uh, this is all about morality. Uh, uh, wrong aim means wrong morality, uh, um, because that is an important part of what a right aim is about. Uh, and then uh, from that wrong morality, uh, this is just the ordinary morality of body and speech, uh, then you have wrong effort. Wrong effort is uh, more about the morality of the mind, yeah? so you don't make an effort to purify yourself mentally. Uh, this comes after body and speech, body and speech being more coarse, and then the effort to purify your mind comes next. Uh, 
And uh, from that uh, wrong effort in purifying your mind, you have wrong mindfulness. You can't really be properly, you can't really be properly mindful at all, but even if you can be mindful, it is a mindfulness based on wrong view, because it's based on wrong view. It's not going to lead to, uh, to the goal of the Buddhist path. Uh, uh, wrong mindfulness is then the, uh, yeah. and, and then that wrong mindfulness leads to the wrong stillness at the end uh, of the whole thing here. Yeah. And what is wrong stillness? Uh, what is miksha samadhi? Is a kind of a strange term. Uh, and it could mean a number of things. It could just mean that you are focused on something fully, uh, but it's more like a sense pleasure or something like that. Uh, but it could, can also mean, miksha samadhi also means in the sutta that it's actually a real state of samadhi, but it's based on wrong view. Uh, and because it is based on wrong view, it means that you are going to understand that state of samadhi in the wrong way. You're going to think it is something that it is not. Uh, in Buddhism, uh, the idea of you attain samadhi is that you investigate it, you use wisdom to take you further. Uh, but uh, if you have wrong view, you may not do that. You may accept this as the purpose of existence. Because that is what samadhi feels like. Yeah? When you get to samadhi, it feels like you have almost achieved the purpose of existence. This is it. I found God or whatever it is, uh, or I found the kind of ultimate state, and then you don't make any further effort because of that. Uh. So this is uh, one of the right ways of thinking about wrong stillness. It sounds kind of a bit uh, strange, wrong stillness. How can stillness be wrong? Well, that is how it is wrong, because it blocks you from going any further. Uh. And then we have the reverse sequence. Uh, uh, knowledge precedes the attainment of uh, skillful qualities. Uh with conscience and prudence following along. Um, a sage, it says here, a sa what is a sage here? Vidasuno, oh, okay. Hmm, okay. Yes. Hmm, okay, that's, uh, okay. Uh, so, um, a sage firm in knowledge uh, gives rise to right view. Right view gives rise to right thought, or right intention, or right aim, or right goal. Right thought gives rise to right speech. Right speech gives rise to right action. Right action gives rise to right livelihood. Right livelihood gives rise to right effort. Right efforts give rise to right mindfulness. And right mindfulness gives rise to right immersion, or samadhi, and stillness. So once you understand how the world works, and you start having skillful qualities because you start acting according to reality. Uh, uh, and then this whole thing comes out and you have a sense of conscience, uh, you have a sense of prudence, understanding the consequences of your actions. Uh, so you have a little kind of wholesome or good kind of shame and you also are a little bit afraid of the consequences of your actions. Uh, when we say being afraid of consequences of your actions, uh, and it's important to kind of realize that the uh, uh, fear is not some kind of very powerful fear. It's just a little bit of enough fear to move you away from uh, the problem and what is bad. Yeah, you kind of you're a little bit kind of. Um, uh, it's, it's not a paralyzing kind of fear. Yeah, it's just a kind of an understanding that if you go there, uh, then you have a problem if you do that. Uh, so fear should be like a balanced fear, a small kind of fear, uh, not some kind of major a major thing which paralyzes you completely. Sometimes if you read some of the suttas that are, you know, about the kind of the length of samsara, how long have you been going on, you know, the mountain of bones that are heaped up from your past life is greater than Mount whatever, uh, and the tears you have shed is more than the tears in the four oceans. Uh, sometimes you get, yeah, help, you know, what am I going to do with this? You can almost get paralyzed, I, I don't want to go on with this. Uh, so this is, um, you have to be careful with some of these teachings, because if we get paralyzed, of course, that is going to be counterproductive. Uh, it's about having that right kind of uh, concern. There is a problem here, yeah? It's like when you go into the traffic afterwards, uh, if you don't look left or right, well, you're pretty much dead. There's lots of cars down here. Uh, that's it, you're finished. Uh, so you have a little bit of fear when you walk into the street. Uh, this, this kind of fear, where you are concerned about the consequences of what you're doing. So you look left, you look right. Uh, if there's car coming, you don't walk into the street. That would be wrong view if you walk into the street when the car is coming. Yeah, yeah? that's kind of classic wrong view because uh, cars are stronger than human bodies. Yeah. So, um, uh, 
so, th so the, these two qualities again, yeah, and then the, the sage, it says here, which is an unusual translation for the Pali, but never mind. Uh, uh, firm in knowledge uh, gives rise to right view. From that seeing things in the right way, right view arises. Uh, you see the world in the way that actually the world is, uh, not in a way contrary to the world. Uh, and uh, of course, from that then comes this whole sequence of right factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, once you have see the world the way it is, then you're going to make wise choices. You're going to make the choices that lead to happiness. You're going to have the right aim, the right purpose, the right goal in life, right intention. Uh, you're going to be heading in a good way because you're basing yourself on sound information about the nature of reality. Uh, so this is right view, it's about seeing things in the right way. Uh, and then from that right aim, the first thing we then do is we get right speech, right action, right livelihood. Uh, these are the things that, uh, uh, because we understand that sila, actually, morality, uh, is something embedded in the nature of reality. If you r live in the right way, it always has good cons consequences. Uh, and this is, of course, part of that right view. Uh, it is interesting here how it is said that right speech leads to right action, the right action leads to right livelihood. Uh, it almost sounds as if there is a sequence between the three, uh, but I'm not sure if there is. It's not entirely clear why there should be a very strong sequence. You could maybe you could argue that right action comes before right livelihood because you have to decide to act in a good way uh, before you kind of take on the right livelihood. That kind of makes sense. Uh, but why right speech should lead to right action, or right action should lead to right speech, or whatever, it is not so clear. You can make arguments about these things, but uh, I think it is more the case that these should really be viewed together as a package of, of morality. Once you have right view, these three come together, more or less. Uh, the reason why they y y one is said to give rise to the other is simply because that is the general kind of uh, idea on the Noble Eightfold Path, so it kind of comes out that way, even though it may not be an important thing. Uh, in, in other places, uh, right action comes before right speech, uh, and that's what makes me wonder whether th there can be any natural sequence between those things. Uh. So you do that, you do all these things, uh, yeah, you and we're going to have a look later on very briefly what these things are, because these are very important things, uh, and although many of you may know these things already, uh, I think it's always nice to review these things at least briefly. Uh. And then, uh, uh, right livelihood gives rise to right effort. Uh. Yeah, you purify your actions and speech, uh, and when your actions and speech are getting purified, uh, the next stage of purification is your mind. And that's where right effort comes in. Uh. And uh, this is sense restraint, this is uh, sati sampajanya, and learning how to think about the world in the right way, and all of these kind of things. Uh, uh, this is uh, right effort. Uh. Um, so uh, you go from the coarse morality uh, to more refined morality. Yeah? This is why the path goes in this way. It starts off with actions and speech, uh, which are the more coarser aspects of morality, goes on to the mental morality, uh, more refined. Uh. And it's important to get the sequence right. Uh, if you get the sequence wrong, you're very unlikely unlike to make uh, progress in quite the same way. Uh. If you st often people start off with meditating without having any kind of sila, it's not going to work because you're getting the sequence wrong. Yeah? You're starting with samasati when you should start with samavacha. Yeah? And then, then, of course, it's not going to have the same kind of effect on the practice. And then when the mind is uh, relatively free of defilements, you have been able to kind of reduce your ill will especially, which is a big problem in these things, uh, then you can move on to the meditation practice, uh, which is the samma sati, the mindfulness part. Uh, and the purpose of mindfulness here is to is purify the mind even more. Uh, yeah? Now the defilements left in the mind are very refined things that hinder you just enough so you can't really enter samadhi properly. The mind doesn't become fully unified. Uh, the mind doesn't kind of uh, uh, doesn't give rise to the highest kind of happiness and, uh, and these things uh, that samadhi gives rise to. And this is one of the main purposes of samasati. It is both vipassana and samatha together and it leads to samma samadhi through giving, getting rid of the very last defilements of the mind. So you can see how the whole path is a, which I said this before, is a path of purification. It's the suddhi maga. 
Yeah, this is what it is. So that, uh, forget about that book, that big book called the Visuddhimagga, forget about that one. This is the real Visuddhimagga that you find in the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, it's a path of purity. Uh, yeah? Gradually, gradually, gradually you become purified more and more until the mind is ready to uh, get into some very profound samadhi. And, uh, uh, and this is the last factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and uh, there you are, you have achieved uh, the kind of the, the purpose or the last what, what the Noble Eightfold Path is all about. Uh, and that is where the Noble Eightfold Path stops. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, the reason why it stops there is that if your Samadhi is profound enough, then again the wisdom happens more or less automatically. You have right view, you know where to look. When you come out you will naturally review what has happened because that's kind of what happens when you have these profound states. And when you review what happens, you will see uh, impermanence, dukkha and anatta very clearly because you see that process which includes these phenomena as you go through the process. You look back upon this. So that is the uh, Samma Samadhi at the very end there. Uh, everything, one thing coming after the other. Uh. So that is uh, in brief uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. I'm not going to look any more at it because um, today we have uh, quite a little bit of ground to cover. I don't want to cover it in too much detail today because I did a, a course here uh, uh, I don't know, if a couple of years ago, whenever it was, when I, I did, did look at the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and um, I think I did anyway, I can't remember now, I think. And, so, and then I did it in great detail. So this year it is better to, I'm going to do it a bit more superficially. So that, but that is, I think, useful, equally useful in many ways. Uh. So, having uh, looked at that, I very briefly, I have the suit, this is actually the same sutta I talked about uh, at the beginning of the course. Uh, and I just want to very briefly bring it up again, uh, just to show you once more where uh, right view comes from in at the end of the day. Uh. So just very briefly about the half of the spiritual life, the sutta which I uh, uh, often bring up on these occasions. Uh. So I have heard, uh, at one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Sakyans, uh, where there was a town named Nag Nagaraka. Nagara, Nagaraka, Nagaraka, uh, yeah, Nagaraka, which means something like the city or something like that. Huh? Then Venerable Ananda went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side and said to him, Sir, good friends, good companions, good associates are half of the spiritual life. Not so, Ananda, not so. Good friends, good companions, good associates are the whole of the spiritual life. A mendicant with good friends, companions and associates can expect, can, can expect to develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is why I'm bringing it up here, because uh, it shows you where the Noble Eightfold Path comes from. Uh, in, uh, and that it comes from a noble friendship, it comes from the word of the Buddha, that's where it arises from. Uh, and uh, in part, that is, of course, because the Buddha is the one with right view. So he starts by imparting right view to each one of us. And then the whole thing begins. So it's interesting, you know, you come back to these very foundational things. Uh, uh, spiritual friendship, uh, noble friendship being one of those, the Kalanamitta being one of the very bases of the entire, of everything in Buddhism pretty much. Uh, and uh, so again, it shows us the importance of coming back to the suttas, uh, coming back to the word of the Buddha, to kind of give us that direction at the very start. Uh, and um, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is important, I, and, and one of the reasons why this is so important is because uh, uh, it is very common in the Buddhist world never to read a single sutta. Uh, yeah, very common, just to ha you have your teacher, uh, whoever that is, and if you are very lucky, you have a, get a really good teacher, and they actually teach you some good Buddhism. But if you're unlucky, you get someone who has wrong view. Huh? And if you have wrong view, you don't even get started on the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and that can be problematic. Yeah? Or you might get sort of partially started, or, or not, not fully started. Huh? So it is uh, always useful, even if you have a really good teacher, uh, it's always useful to come back to the suttas uh, and to get the gold standard of w what Buddhism is about. Uh. And this is what this, uh, what this is really saying. And of course, every time you contemplate these suttas, every time you think about them, you think about them in a with wisdom in the right way, uh, 
then you are reinforcing the message, reinforcing right view as the foundation of this path. Uh, so this is why it is so useful. Uh, and because we tend to forget, uh, especially when, when you have a very busy life, you tend to forget that uh, it's important to get these things reinforced uh, on a regular basis. Uh. <coughs> and that is that famous simile which I have spoken about before about the rain on the mountaintop. Uh, as long as it keeps raining, eventually the water will have to go to the ocean. Uh, and that rain is equivalent to hear hearing the good Dhamma and the ocean is Nibbana. So uh, you just have to keep on doing it uh, and eventually you will get there. Uh. So uh, it is, uh, it is always, was always one of those things that I found very fascinating when I was uh, getting reading the sutta. Sometimes you, s you see things that seem uh, over the top or seem strange or seem hard to grasp. And this was actually one of those things that I didn't really understand. It took me a long time to understand what this is about. Uh, when the Buddha says it is a hundred percent of the spiritual life, uh, noble friendship, uh, it kind of didn't really, I sort of read it, but didn't really go in properly. I didn't understand what it really was referring to. I thought the Buddha was maybe exaggerating, uh, yeah, because surely th there, are th there are other things as well as the noble uh, friendship on the spiritual path. That's not all there is. Uh, what about all the other factors? Uh, you know, you have to be nice, you have to be compassionate, you have to do all these kind of things. Uh, until it dawns on you that uh, uh, the reason why it is 100% is because there is no spiritual path at all without the Buddha. Uh, without him, uh, without someone who wakes up, uh, there is nothing. Uh, you are just left in darkness, you don't even get started on the path. Uh, so the Buddha is absolutely required as the foundation stone. Uh, and this again comes back to the whole idea of non-self and how we are conditioned as beings uh, and how unless we have some input in our lives that drives us and heads us in the right direction, uh, it is almost impossible to find that way yourself unless you become a Pacheka Buddha uh, or something like that or a Samma Sam Buddha. But the problem with that uh, is that there is no path to those things. Uh, yeah, so it is uh, it's kind of uh, you, you're fumbling around in the dark and if you are extremely lucky, if you are one in ten billion, uh, then you might become a Pacheka Buddha or something like that, but uh, very unlikely to happen. Uh. So this is why it is so important, yeah, because we are like this old simile of the boat on the ocean, the boat which is just drifting around, depending on the currents, depending on the winds, uh, doesn't have a rudder, doesn't have any steering mechanism, being entirely dependent on external conditions and phenomena. In the same way, we are, uh, we are a bit like that as human beings. Boats drifting around in samsara until we get the current coming from the right side and the current and the wind coming from the right side is the Dhamma that someone has discovered and then your boat starts to head in the good direction rather than heading in the, in the wrong way. Heading to the good weather, he heading to the nice beaches, the nice land uh, where you can kind of uh, lie down in the shade of the beautiful palm trees. Uh, remember that? Uh, Sutta, uh, you go there and you lie down in the shade of the palm trees. That was the Sutta we did before about uh, uh, anger, uh, ill will, uh, and how to find uh, the right kind of spiritual guide in life, etc. Anyway, so this is why this is so important. And then the Buddha says, and, and how does a mendicant with good friends develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path? Uh, it's when a mendicant develops the right view, uh, which relies on seclusion again, fading away and cessation, and ripens in letting go. Uh, they develop right aim or intention, uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right stillness, uh, which relies on seclusion, fading away and cessation and ripens in letting go. Uh. That's how a mendicant with good friends uh, develops and cultivates the noble eightfold path. Uh. So, uh, there you are, uh, when you have the right kind of friends, uh, you uh, eightfold path just happens almost well it happens it happens uh. <laughs> and uh, again you see there's uh, things that it relies on there uh, seclusion fading away and cessation this is similar to what we saw with the uh, sambhujangas before uh, the seven factors of awakening uh, yeah the idea of being secluded uh, the idea of allowing things to fade away and cease uh, and this is what how the path is developed if you want to develop it to the maximum. Uh. So uh, I'm not going to say more about that. It's a very nice little sutta and it's worth reflecting on. There's a lot of 
a, a nice information in simple teachings like that that actually is very profound. Uh, it seems simple, but it has a lot of uh, co the consequences of this. So where it comes from uh, is actually comes from something very profound, uh, and that is why it is uh, uh, so interesting here. Now, I what I want to do now is to look at the idea of right view in a little bit more detail here. And uh, right view at the beginning of the Buddhist path uh, is defined in two different ways in the suttas. Uh, and one way it is defined is the insight into the Four Noble Truths. Uh, yeah, If you have that, then you have right view. And I'm not going to talk so much about that now. I'm going to talk instead about the more kind of regular right view that the suttas talk about. Uh, uh, and this is what comes here in this little sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya 41, the people of Sala. And this is the ordinary right view, and that's the right view that, you, uh, uh, that um, the Buddha lays down if you're not an Arya. But of course the Four Noble Truths as well can be understood roughly, uh, but this is kind of the, the way that it is uh, usually explained for non-Aryans in the sutta. So, so you have right view, uh, undistorted uh, Perspective, uh, uh, undistorted perspective. What is that in Pali? Uh, um, it is aviparita dasano. Yeah. So this means like you, yeah, undistorted, un, uh, unbiased, or un, uh, in, uh, something like that. Perspective. In other words, again, it's about seeing things according to reality. This is kind of that you're not distorted, uh, you're not deluded about things. Uh, and then when you're not deluded, you know there is giving, there is sacrifice, there is offering. Uh, yeah? In other words, the idea that uh, generosity uh, and offering of things actually is an important part of uh, how the world works. Uh, and um, it's kind of interesting that this is there in right view, uh, yeah, at the very beginning, uh, the idea that uh, 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 generosity is an important part of life. Uh, and uh, it shows you the importance of generosity on the Buddhist path. Uh, and it's very easy to underestimate these kind of things and think that it is just a secondary thing or is something that uh, once you get to a certain level you can kind of leave generosity behind you. Uh, once you get to a certain amount of insight and understanding that the early parts of the path are no longer so important. Uh, yeah, once you become wise, uh, and once you get crazy wisdom, uh, you don't have to worry about the morality anymore because now you have gained the wisdom that goes beyond morality. Uh, now you are so uh, so detached, you are no longer attached to detachment. Uh, and then you... <laughs> <laughs> sounds wise, yeah? So detached, no longer attached to detachment. Whoa! And, and <laughs> these are some of the excuses that people come up with uh, yeah? when they kind of... they, they uh, have, have misunderstood uh, how the world works, uh, and these are the excuses that uh, they come up with so they can indulge in worldly things even though uh, it, is, uh, it, it goes against the idea of what the Dhamma is about. Uh, and I think, yeah, anyway. So generosity is a very important part of the path, and you, in many places in the suttas you find that generosity is the, one of the foundation stones. Uh, yeah, when the Buddha uh, tells what he calls the gradual, one of the examples of the gradual training is a very short little verse uh, that gives the path in, in detail, uh, in, 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 in brief rather I should say, uh, and it always starts off with generosity. Then it goes on to morality afterwards. Uh, yeah, and then it talks about renunciation and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, the idea of generosity is something you carry with you uh, throughout the practice of the path. Uh, and the further you go along the path, uh, the more generous you tend to be. Uh, to be able to become a stream mentor, you have to perfect generosity. Uh, there's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful um, way that the stream mentor is uh, described. Uh, and uh, uh, this is actually was found in one of the suttas that we looked at before, but I stopped short of uh, of describing that. Uh, actually, I, I got it right here, so I'll, I'll read it out for you. This is how the stream mentor is described. Yeah? Uh, and he, uh, a noble disciple, recollects his own generosity thus. Uh, it is truly my good fortune, again, that in the population obsessed by the stain of miserliness, uh, I dwell, uh, stinginess, I dwell at home with a mind devoid of the stain of being stingy. Uh, 
freely generous, open-handed, delighting in relinquishment, uh, devoted to charity, delighting and giving and sharing. Yeah. So that is the, uh, the stream entry. Yeah, so you, are, you have this kind of openness of mind whereby you are always willing to share and give. Uh, of course, knowing your limitations, knowing what is right, not overdoing it, uh, uh, having a sense of balance in these things, uh, but nevertheless, it's an important part of the, of the Buddhist path. Uh, and the reason why it is so important is because it goes against the whole idea of selfishness. It goes against the idea of me, my things, yeah, keep away, yeah, this is my stuff, don't touch my, my this one, this is mine, uh, don't touch it. Uh, and uh, once you have that kind of feeling of me and mine, and you're very protective of your things, uh, it is a very small kind of mind state, a mind state that is really opposite, opposed to the idea of the large mind which is full of metta and compassion for all beings, which goes out to the world. Instead you become small and afraid of the world around you, because when you're stingy, you look after all things, the world looks scary outside. Uh, so you reverse that, uh, and instead of being scared uh, by the world, uh, uh, you have a, a completely different uh, idea of it, and you open up instead, uh, and you kind of allow the world into your heart. It's almost the exact opposite. Uh, and if you know the feeling of generosity, uh, when you are gen generous in a good way, uh, and your mind kind of opens up, it's actually it's a, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, it's a very beautiful feeling. Uh, and uh, you know why this is a spiritual feeling, why it is something on the Buddhist path, uh, because it is something that is a uh, you can almost feel that it's free of defilements. It is pure, it is delightful, it is something very positive inside of you. So this is the idea of generosity. It's not just about giving blindly, it's about giving in such a way that it actually feels really nice, it feels really positive. Then it becomes a force on the path. And this is why the Buddha says, uh, you know, when you give, you should uh, give where you feel inspired, uh, because that it so doesn't really matter where you give. Uh, we shouldn't think you have to give just to Buddhist causes or whatever. Wherever you feel inspired is the right place to give. Uh, wherever you feel that you kind of you feel compassion, you feel uh, you feel good about it. Uh, that is the right place. Uh, and then you uh, develop this foundational aspect of the Buddhist path. Uh, so this is comes even before morality, which is really fascinating here. Yeah. So there is uh, this idea of giving, yeah, giving matters. Uh, and there are some amusing uh, examples in the suttas, of, uh, that actually has more to do with morality, uh, but also with giving, and examples of the wrong view. And there were supposed to have been uh, teachers in ancient India who had the view that uh, even, if you, uh, even if you go along the the southern bank or the river Ganges and you slaughter all living beings yeah, and you pile up all the meat that results from that, all the flesh that all in a massive pile of flesh, you kill every, everything, you have done no bad karma, nothing is wrong with that, yeah, it's all okay. And, uh, and even if you go along the northern bank of the river Ganges and you are generous and you help everyone and you're kind, you have made no good karma because of that. Uh. So you can imagine what kind of world comes from that sort of view. Yeah? If you follow that, uh, the world becomes a pretty disastrous <laughs> place after a while. Uh, so hopefully this was more theoretical than practical. I think it's very hard to actually live like that. Uh, so presumably it was more a theoretical view than actually a practical view. Uh, because otherwise uh, uh <laughs> it would be pretty, pretty dismal. Anyway, so that is... Uh, uh, probably the one reason why the Buddha brings this out, and it shows you how important it is, uh, the fact that it is right there at the very foundation of what the Buddhism uh, is and how it works. So then you have the idea of there are fruits and results of good and bad deeds. Uh, yeah, If you do something good and bad, uh, then there will be results coming from that. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, I, the way I like to view this, is simply to understand the connection right now between, between your intentions uh, and how you feel about yourself. Uh, and uh, too often, karma is uh, kind of made into this magical thing uh, whereby you do a g kind act in this life, and because you do a kind act in this life, uh, the mansion is being built in heaven right there and then as you do the act of kindness. Uh, this is how it is described in the 
uh, what is called the Vimana Vatu, uh, which means like the, uh, the heavenly, uh, Vimana is a heavenly mansion, uh, and the Vatu is the story of the heavenly mansion. And it literally says that you do an act of kindness, and as you do an act of kindness, uh, the heavenly mansion is expanding and being built, yeah, duk, 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 coming up, uh, more towers, more everything like that. Uh. And that is a, is a very kind of a simplistic view of the idea of Kama. And it's not a very useful one, in my opinion. So much better to think of Kama. And this is, I think, something we can all experience. And this is what is so good about it. Uh, just feel what it feels like when you act. Uh, feel the feeling of doing an act of kindness. Uh, sometimes it may not feel very much because you're not attuned to it or you're not doing it perhaps quite in the right way. Uh, but often when you do an act of kindness, you will feel good about yourself. Uh, and that's Kama, yeah? is the direct connection between your intention uh, and how you feel, your f feel about yourself. Uh, and the Buddha does actually mention this type of Kama in the Sutta, it's called the Ditta Dhamma Kama, the Kama in this very life, uh, where you feel good about yourself. Uh. So uh, there are fruits and results of uh, good and bad actions, uh, you can see that at least to some extent, uh, and uh, this builds up and builds up and builds up. Uh, and then eventually when you get reborn, uh, you have built up something positive and bright inside of yourself, and then you continue at that level. And this is how you then get reborn in a good location as a consequence. Uh, when you think about it, it's actually very natural. Uh, the whole thing kind of makes really good sense, uh, because you are just, uh, uh, these are natural principles for how the mind develops and carries on into the future. Uh, and uh, do you also get a heavenly mansion? Uh, <laughs> is that maybe you do, yeah, maybe that, maybe that is kind of an addition, maybe that's kind of how the world works, uh, but it's not uh, a kind of the uh, central focus, I think, on what these things are about. Uh, but if you would like a heavenly mansion, fair enough, most people would like to have a heavenly mansion, so you can add that in there as a bonus, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this is the good and results, the good and bad results of, or results of good and bad deeds. Uh, and then there is uh, the idea that there is an afterlife, there is this world, there is the other world, atti ayang loka, atti paro loko, which means uh, uh, that, you know, there is this contrast between the life now and the life we have afterwards. Uh, this is part of right view. There is an afterlife, there is rebirth. This is what the Buddha is saying here. Uh, and uh, uh, why is this so important? Why does it matter so much? And the reason why it matters uh, is because it changes our calculations about what is important in our lives. It changes our values to some extent. Uh, and this is uh, w the thing that I've been, I was talking about so much that I really enjoy talking about, is this uh, understanding of the limits of the world around us, uh, how it always tends to let us down in the end, uh, how everything that is dear and agreeable to us somehow at the end of the day, it will collapse, it will let us down, it will be problematic. Uh, everything we own, all the friends and family that we have, eventually they will have to die. Uh, yeah? And uh, if there is no afterlife, uh, if nothing happens afterwards, you just disappear and bang, that's it, uh, then it's not really so much of a problem. Uh, but if there is an afterlife and you carry on into the future, uh, then of course what is important uh, is how that carrying on happens. Uh, yeah, how, how, what will happen to you after you die here? And if you come to your death uh, and everything you have invested in, as I said so many times already, but it's a really nice idea, everything you have invested in belongs to this world. Yeah, everything you have done belongs to this world. You have built up money, built up possession, built up relationships, built up status, uh, built up an education for yourself. But the moment you die, all of that is empty. It has no purpose anymore. It belongs to this life. You can't take it with you into the future. All you can take with you into future, the future is the kind of men mind that you have built up, uh, because the mind carries on. Uh. So if you have built up a bright and pure, and pure mind, uh, a mind that has all these beautiful qualities through living in the right way, that goes with you into the future. Uh. If you don't believe in a rebirth, uh, then all of this is kind of irrelevant. Uh, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, there's far more reason to invest in this life, yeah, and put all your everything into what is happening in this life. Uh. But once you have an idea of rebirth, your entire way of looking at the world starts to change. Uh, and the things that matter are actually very different. Your values change. Uh, your idea of the future changes. Uh, so this is why uh, rebirth really matters uh, enormously. Uh, 
And uh, I'm always surprised how some people seem to think that actually whether you believe in rebirth doesn't matter or not because you, you can still be nice even though you don't believe in rebirth. True, you can be, uh, but the kind of the weight it is given and the importance of this changes dramatically once you take into account a much bigger picture. Uh, uh, imagine lying on your deathbed uh, and everything you have done belongs to this world. Uh, now everything has to go. Uh, yeah, and the future kind of you wonder what w and then you get start to get this feeling that maybe there is life afterwards because you start to see things you start to experience maybe the mind starting to leave the body yeah you start to realize actually wait a minute something going on here I'm moving on to something else and then you start to panic a little bit because this wasn't part of your plan yeah or you forgot about that Imagine that feeling, it must be terrible. Everything you have done belongs to this world. Everything you have done, you have to leave behind. Did you waste your life? Maybe you wasted your life completely. What was the point of living a hundred years? And now you have lived all that time. There's nothing to take with you into the future. You feel confused, you feel empty, you feel stupid, you feel silly, because you know that you haven't lived your life to, for any use. And this is the thing, this is kind of why this outlook actually changes your idea of what your value is in life, what is important, uh, what is why the spiritual life really matters. It is how we live is far more important than what we accumulate in this life. Uh, the how is what matters. It's okay to accumulate things. I'm not saying it's bad. It's perfectly okay. You can be wealthy, poor, educated, stupid. All of these things are okay. Nothing wrong with them. But that, that is not the essence of what life is, is about. And that is where you kind of miss out. So rebirth uh, is, uh, is so fundamental to, to the Buddhist outlook. Yeah? And you, can, uh, you start to get a feeling for it when you start to think about these things carefully uh, and how uh, things tend to work out. Uh, then uh, there is the uh, the next one, uh, which is uh, which I really like, and this is the one about the uh, there is mother and father. Uh, that's what the Pali says quite literally. There is mother and father, which Adan Sudato has translated that there there is obligation to mother and father. Uh, that is adding a little bit of his own interpretation, but I think it's reasonable enough. And what does that mean? Uh, and uh, what that means is that uh, we have a debt of gratitude to our parents. That's really what it means. Uh, and uh, the Buddha talks about uh, one's parents in the suttas. Uh, he calls your parents your pubacharya, your first teachers or your ancient teachers. Uh, he calls your parents like Brahma. They are like Brahma because your parents, uh, they will tend to love you regardless of what you do in life, which is kind of amazing. Uh, yeah, uh, it's kind of unheard of. Uh, nobody else might love you, but your parents will tend to love you. Uh, and uh, this is kind of what one of those strange, one of those amazing things, like it says in the Metta Sutta, uh, like, you know, the, the love like a mother has for her only child. Uh, and this is the mother always able and willing to forgive her child, almost regardless of what that child does. Uh, why is that? How can the mother do that? And the, I think the reason is because the mother has seen this child from it was tiny, tiny, all the way through her. And she has seen all the good qualities and all the good things. Uh, and she will never forget that. Uh, so that for that reason, she will always be able to forgive the things that happen afterwards. Uh, and that kind of gives you the idea uh, for us. It's the same kind of thing. Uh, we look for the positive qualities in other people, just as we are the mother of uh, all other people. Uh, well, or maybe not all, you know, we, we mother of uh, anyone we find difficult. Uh, you can always think of yourself as the mother of someone, yeah, or the father maybe of someone, uh, uh, if you find them difficult. How would you feel about them if you were their mother? You would see them in a different way. Uh. And in a sense, this is kind of, it actually is not entirely unrealistic either, because when you have been through samsaric existence, well that's what it says in some of the suttas. We have had all kinds of relationship with other people around us uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, so we probably have been mothers of each other, yeah? each, each one of us, or fathers, uh, or, or both. Uh. So, you know, you have all been, been my mother and father in the past. Uh. I have been your mother and father in the past, uh, each one of you probably. Uh, it's kind of nice, yeah? It makes it easy to forgive and to let go and to, uh, and to sort of uh, make things work out in the right way. Uh. 
So you remember that. And what that means is that we treat our mother and father in a good way, if we can, without making it into a burden. It's not about making these things into a burden. If you make them into a burden, then actually it becomes problematic. You try to do it with a positive mind state. You try to do it in such a way that it becomes something joyful. So you need to think about your parents in the right way. And when you think about them in the right way, it becomes much easier to do. If it becomes a chore, oh no, I've got to look after my parents, it's kind of part of you know, the Asian culture, you really have to look after your parents all the time, or, and that sort of thing, yeah. then oh, it becomes a burden. Yeah? Many people say it is a burden, but that is the wrong way of doing it, because then it doesn't give rise to the joy and the positive feelings at the base of the path. And the other part of this is that uh, uh, your parents are a very powerful field of merit. Yeah? If you are able to treat your parents well, uh, then actually you can make enormous amounts of good karma at the same time. Uh, because your, your parents are, uh, because of the closeness of connection, all of that, uh, they are a very powerful field of merit. And that's why if you kill your parents, uh, it's a bad idea. Yeah? It's a really bad idea and it kind of leads to very bad consequences uh, because of that. Uh, so use this opportunity to look after your parents. Use it as a kind of opportunity for spiritual growth. Uh, and often it has very powerful consequences. Uh, and uh, just to give you an example, I just, uh, you know, an example from my own life, because I know how these, you know, usually your own experiences are often the best ones, because they are the ones when you really can see how these things work. Uh, and I have said many times before, to some of you will know about this already, but when I became a monk, my parents were not very impressed. Uh, like many parents, yeah, not too happy when you end up becoming a Buddhist monk. Yeah. And they, and they kind of, we didn't bring you up for this. Yeah, this was not kind of, we didn't support you and you know, everything before your education or whatever to become a Buddhist monk. Yeah. You know, we have failed in our upbringing, that kind of thing. <laughs> what my, fa my father said to me at the time. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I was pretty stubborn, yeah? So I said, yeah, okay, whatever. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I became a Buddhist monk anyway, and they eventually they gave me permission because they realized there's no point in not giving you permission. Uh, but what was interesting, initially when I became a Buddhist monk, you when you start off with this teaching, you become really excited. You think, wow, this is it. This is, you know, this, there's nothing else. This is all there is in life. The, what else do you want to do? And you sort of try to tell your parents about it. Uh, but because they are already not too happy that you are a Buddhist monk, it's a bad idea to try to convert them. It's not going to work. So I realized that and I thought, well, I, there must be another way of doing this. And of course, what I realized is that what you have to do is you have to live the example. Uh, yeah. You have to live the example of what a son is supposed to be like for their parents. Uh, and that's what I tried to do. So I, I tried to treat my parents in a new way. Uh, but not because of an obligation, but trying to come from ge genuine kindness, trying to understand what parents really are, why they are worthy of being treated kindly, trying to see my parents you know, as people, trying to see their good qualities and all of these kind of things. Uh, and gradually I was, able I was able to do that, I think, reasonably well. Uh, and after a while my parents were pretty impressed, yeah? This, this Buddhist teachings I must be working, you know? He, he, <laughs> he used to be really rebellious, now he's kind of friendly, what's going on here? Uh, and what happens is that, and this is kind of the amazing thing, my parents were never very religious people, they were kind of, didn't really have any religion, which is very common in the part of the world where I come from, the people are not really religious. And so uh, it was, they were kind of open to anything. So after a while they started to inquire, what, what, what is this all about really? And then they started to ask me, well maybe you, would, you want to teach us some meditation? Yeah, maybe you would like to teach us a little bit about Buddhism? Then we started to have discussions about Buddhism. And after a few, after uh, maybe about 15 years as a monk, yeah, uh, took a while, but <laughs> eventually they come around and now they pretty much call themselves Buddhist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm always surprised because my father always tells me, oh yeah, I just watched your, your video on YouTube. Yeah, you gave a talk like that. <laughs> And that's really kind of astonishing, and you see the power, it's really the power of the Dhamma, because it is the power of these teachings uh, to touch people's hearts and understand that there is something here that is very useful and very beautiful. Uh, and uh, so this is a, a kind of how this works, yeah? and the power of that uh, relationship between parents and their children can be very, very powerful if it is done in the right way. Uh, and that is one of the things that I realized. Uh, 
So uh, anyway, I, that is just to give you uh, an example of how these things can work. And um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so that is the relationship between parents and uh, children. And um, just very briefly, the very last few parts of the idea of right view here, there are beings who are reborn spontaneously. Uh, uh, this is kind of a, a slightly strange part of right view, but the idea is just that uh, uh, there are various kinds of realms, uh, yeah, beings being reborn in all kinds of realms. Uh, so it kind of expands the potential for rebirth uh, and expands the potential for experiencing happiness and pain. Uh. And then you have the last one, uh, and that is there are ascetics and Brahmins, uh, yeah, and spiritual people who are well attained and well practiced uh, and who describe the afterlife after realizing it with their own insight or their own understanding. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to have some, this is right view, you have to have some right feeling that there are people in this world, uh, yeah, spiritual people who actually have practiced in a good way and they have attained something profound uh, and they have seen the next world, they have seen the idea of rebirth. Uh, that is again specifically stated. So, you know, the idea of, of uh, of um, faith in rebirth, it is directly their part and parcel of having faith in the Buddha or having faith in other spiritual beings. Without that, there is nothing. Without some faith in the spiritual life, without some faith in uh, the possibility of spiritual practice of the Buddha and all of these kind of things, uh, there is nothing. You don't even get started. Uh, there's no potential at all. Uh, if you haven't get the, got the qualities, uh, the mental inclination that makes it possible for you to appreciate the Buddha, appreciate spiritual practice, then there is no hope. Uh, and there's nothing much you can do for, the, for a person like that. Uh, so that is the basic, uh, kind of the basic thing. And again, you see there the inclusion of rebirth is part of that as well. People who have seen this particular thing. Uh. So that is uh, uh, the idea of right view, yeah, in an ordinary mundane uh, sense, uh, not really the kind of full understanding of what these things are about. Uh, and uh, you can add many of the other things that we have been doing and looking at during this retreat, uh, the idea of you know where true happiness is to be found and these kind of things, uh, they are all part and parcel of this. Uh, and they're part and parcel of the Four Noble Truths as well, which is about Dukkha, the origin of Dukkha, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and all of these things, when you think about it together, forms a particular outlook, a particular way of looking at the world uh, that aligns with the way the world is according to Buddhism and then your values start to change. Uh, the way what you do, what you prioritize in life, uh, how you live your life, everything starts to align with that. Uh, and this is why this has to be the foundation for any kind of spiritual practice. Uh, so, that is a right view in brief for you. Uh, um, let us uh, l uh, leave it at that uh, and let us take a break uh, and we'll see you back here again in about 40 minutes, uh, 20 minutes time. Uh.